Hi right, folks, uh, in this video we're going to look at kind of, you know, some of the, uh, the deformation, the stresses, the forces that happen uh, with plate tectonics at some of these different boundaries, right? So just to uh, um, recap here real quick, uh, plate tectonics, right? We got the lithosphere, that's the outer shell of our earth, right? Our continents are much thicker and less dense than our oceanic crust, right? We also have, right, so the lithosphere again being continental or, or oceanic part, crust plus that uppermost part of the upper mantle moving around together as a rigid body on the asthenosphere, right? And as we learned in our very first lab, the continental plates ride higher because they're less dense, right? But they're also thicker. What do they ride on? They ride on the asthenosphere, this plasticky, uh, partially molten, it's not liquid, but it is a buoyant surface, right, on which uh, relative density is very important. So looking at kind of, you know, our, our uh, plate tectonics theory modernly, right, we have this, this rigid lithosphere, which decouples, that's a big word, just to mean separate from uh, uh, the, the asthenosphere it moves about on this asthenosphere, right? Uh, today we have around seven larger plates, these Pacific, North American, South American, African, Eurasian, Antarctic plate. And then we have a number of minor plates, the Cocos plate, the Juan de Fuca, you know, the Arabian plate, stuff like that, right? And they end up getting kind of bumped and squished around by some of these larger plates quite often, right? However, plates can interact with each other in three different types of ways or in three different types of boundaries. First, we have divergent boundaries coming apart, convergent boundaries coming together or converging, right? And then transform boundaries, and that is sliding paths. So plates can do one of things, three things that can pull apart, they can come together, or they can slide past, right? So when we're looking at these uh, these oceanic plates, or these, these uh, lithospheric plates, how thick are they, right? So if, if humans were the size of an insect, right, our oceanic lithosphere would be, you know, you know, relative to you, the size of an ant, about the Varnum building downtown Grand Rapids, right? A skyscraper, but not a massive skyscraper. The continental lithosphere, on the other hand, being much thicker, would be more around the size of the Empire State Building as far as thickness goes, right? When you're the size of an ant, right? Just to put it in kind of relative scale with that, right? So these are very, very thick blocks of, you know, you know, rock, but they're still, again, just the candy coating on our, our, our earth, right? Just the shell of our earth. Right? So when we come to uh, deformation and stresses that rocks can experience, right? Well, first of all, stress is the force applied per unit area. It's a measure of concentration of force, right? Pounds per square inch, stuff like that, right? So when rocks are subject to a force or a stress greater than uh, the strength that they possess to withstand, they know as what's deform, and deformation just being a general term, applied to a rock changing shape uh, in any way, right? So there's a couple different ways we can deform rocks, right? Plastically or brittly, right? But deformation, right? Too much stress when you exceed what that rock can take, you're going to deform, break, jumble that rock, right? So here's a look at a couple different kinds of ways that rocks can deform. First in what we call ductile deformation or kind of plastic deformation, right? You see this kind of bending of these rocks that has occurred here, right? So the bending of the rocks, this is a ductile kind of deformation flowing or folding, right? We also have brittle deformation fracturing, and you can see that right in here. There's lots of them, but this is a very good fracture, right? You can see that this part and this part used to be connected, right, lined up, but now they've been fractured and moved apart. This line or this plane of fracture is what's known as a fault, right? A fault line, a fault plane, right? There are a couple different ways in which we can apply uh, stress to a rock. And the first one is confining stress or uniform stress. This is the pressure that happens when something gets buried, right? Equal pressure in all directions. What happens? You just get, you know, as you get buried with more and more rock on top of you, uh, there's more pressure in all directions. You become generally, you know, denser and, and occupy less volume, right? But the other way we can apply stress is what's called non-uniform or differential stress. And this is when you have one direction of stress that is much more intense than the others, right? And this is the kind of stress that we are dealing with at plate tectonic boundaries. We are dealing with this differential, non-uniform, unequal stresses, right? So, 
let's look at the three types of stresses that we can apply to these rocks, right? And then we'll relate those back to the three different types of, of plate tectonic boundaries, right? So three different types of differential stress. First, we have compressional, pushing together, right? This can be found at, at, uh, at convergent plate margins, right? Where things are coming together. The idea here is you have a space problem. The space problem is you don't have enough space, right? You're pushing everything together, right? So if things are going to have to shorten and thicken, right? So think of like the Himalayas mountains, right? Shorten and thicken when India collapsed or crashed into um, uh, Asia about 40 million years ago. Right? The second type of stress we have is tensional, right? Tension, putting tension on a rope pulling right this is associated with divergent boundaries right where that unequal direction of stress is using a tensional or pulling apart right so here we have another space issue right but here the issue is we have too much space right in order to accommodate this too much space we're going to have to shorten and thicken take think about taking a piece of taffy or play-doh and stretching it out right that's tensional it's going to shorten and thicken right and then the third kind, we have shearing, like shearing or scissors, moving past, sliding past, right? This is what we find at transform plate boundaries, right? This is where the rocks are going to slide past each other, right? The most uh, famous transform boundary uh, on the planet, of course, being the San Andreas Fault in California, right? So again, compressional pushing together, right? So the space issue it's accommodating here is there's not enough space. Things are going to have to shorten and thicken, right? Tensional pulling apart these are a divergent boundary space issue here is uh that we have too much space things are going to have to lengthen extend and thin right and then shearing right found at transform boundaries the space issue here is you have solid rock trying to move in two different directions at once right and how we accommodate for a lot of this are through what we call faulting right so faults those fractures in the wall right or in the those fractures in the rock right that allow movement right and and uh accommodate this type of movement right so the first kind we have up here right is the kind we find at a divergent margin right these are tensional right so we're experiencing extension and lengthening right what we get here are called normal faults and to accommodate this lengthening Again, like I said, this crust has to shorten and thin. So hopefully we can see this here if I hold this like this. These are my fault block models. First of all, let me orient you to a fault, right? So here we have the top and the bottom of that fault, right? The bottom is called the foot wall. It's the part that you can stand on, right? And the top is called the hanging wall. It's the part you could hang from, right? So if this is the fault plane, this is the hanging wall. This is the foot wall, right? couple other things to uh, align you to here when we talk about faults, right? This line that the fault expresses on the surface of the earth, this is known as a strike, right? So here is the strike of this fault right along in this direction here, right? The dip of a fault is always perpendicular to strike by definition, and it's basically running, you know, the steepest way down that, that fault plane, that fault surface, right? So here we have our strike of our fault, and our dip of our fault, right? And the first two types of, uh, of uh, faults we're going to talk about are called dip-slip faults because they slip in the direction of dip, right? So the first one, this is a divergent. This is what we call a normal fault. I don't know why it's a normal fault. I didn't name it, but there it is, right? So here we have a space issue again, not or, or too much space. To accommodate, we're going to have to shorten and thin, right? As you notice, the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. It drops to help accommodate that lengthening, right? As I pull this apart, it drops to accommodate that lengthening, right? That is a normal fault when the hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall, right? And we can trace that, you know, in these layers. So these, this layer here, this layer here, they used to be together, right? Now this way of the hanging wall has dropped down relative to the foot wall. That is a normal fault, right? The next kind is also a dip-slip fault because it slips on dip, right? And this is the kind we experience at convergent margins where we get compressional for or stress, right? And again, the space issue here is we don't have enough space, right? We're pushing things together in order to accommodate that, right? We're going to have to shorten. 
or shorten and thicken, right? So there we go. So extension, normal faulting, right? Thinning, hanging wall moves down relative to the foot wall. And these are called reverse faults when we have compression and we have the space issue where we have to shorten and thicken, right? This is called a, a reverse fault when the hanging wall moves up relative to the foot wall, right? Moves up relative to the foot wall. Right? That is a reverse fault, right? So again, normal faults, extension, reverse fault, compression, right? And then the last kind of fault we have here is known as our, our strike slip fault, right? So instead of slipping on dip, it slips on strike, right? And this is, for example, our San Andreas fault, right? So what we get movement here is tends to be in that kind of motion, right? And again, this is accommodating the fact that this solid mass wants to move in two different directions at the same time, right? Let's go really quick and talk about some of the mechanisms, right, for, uh, for driving forces behind plate tectonics, right? One of them is mantle convection. That is not only a mechanism, but also a theory behind uh, plate tectonics, right? This plastically partially molten athenosphere, uh, right, is, is uh, our, pl our plates are riding on that, right? It's undergoing thermal convection. That's, that's causing the plates to move apart, kind of like a conveyor belt, right? couple other forces that get uh, involved in plate tectonics are ridge push, right? You notice this ridge where this, you know, it's nice and warm. We got magma forming here. You know, that's going to cause kind of a thermal rise, right? Gravity simply is going to start to pull this plate away at that divergent margin, right? As it kind of gravitationally falls down this little slope. That is ridge push. Right? The third one is slab pull. So as you get down here, right, as this starts to descend and we start to drive water off that plate, right, and it starts to be added to uh, and, you know, cause partial melting that rises buoyantly, right? Uh, but as water is being driven up, as the plate heats up, there's actually a large pulling force that is actually created that's going to, uh, you know, help pull these, uh, you know, actually uh, create quite a big force pulling this this plate down. So we have mantle convection, ridge push, and slab pull. Those are the three kind of mechanisms behind plate tectonics, right? And just so uh, you were reminded, right, uh, overlaying on them now, I did the, you know, flash back and forth earlier in the, the, um, the lecture, but here we have, you know, the, the volcanoes, those locations, and earthquakes plotted on top of each other. These are all known as tectonic activity, right, because they're related to the tectonic plates. And in fact, as you see, right, this tends to denote, you know, where where the location of these earthquakes and volcanoes helps us find, you know, and mark the plate boundaries, even some of these smaller plates like the Caribbean plate and the Cocos plate, right, we can see some of those, right, there's the Philippine plate, right, all demarcated by the locations of volcanoes and earthquakes and mountain building activities. All right, folks, see you in the next episode.